Welcome to another episode of Food History Happy Hour. My name is Sarah Wasberg Johnson, also known as the Food Historian. Um, and tonight, we're going to make a cocktail, as per usual, talk a little bit about food history. I'll take questions. And so if you are watching, you should say hi, like Marty just did. Hi, Marty. Thanks for joining us. Um, tonight, we're going to do something a little bit different than we have done in the past episodes. Um, we're going to have a kind of choose your own adventure cocktail option here. So as some of you might remember, last week um, I made celery infused gin. So I have some of it here. It's not looking the greatest. Right now all of the color is being leached out of the celery leaves. Um, but I thought we would do a little bit of that. So if you're here, you should say hi. So I know that you're watching. Um, and then we'll just hang out for a second and then get started. So it's not horribly cold out anymore. We had some lovely rain recently and everything is blooming. And now today it was like 62 degrees. So I'm not wearing a giant sweater, which is great. Well, maybe we'll just go ahead and get started then with the cocktail. So I infused my celery gin. I have the gin that I use here. Um, it's called New Amsterdam. Hi, Glenn. <laughs> uh, which I bought because I thought it was a local New York gin. It's not. Sadly, it is made in Modesto, California. But it's not an American gin. It's um, a little bit more like the classic London dry gin, which I thought would go well with our celery. So here's the deal. This is where we're doing the choose your own adventure. I am going to mix the gin. And of course, I forgot an ingredient, but who cares? I'm not going to use it. I'm going to mix gin with one of three citrus fruits. Your options are grapefruit blood orange, or lemon. Okay, so I forgot my sugar, like I always do, which is terrible. Hi, Ashley. Um, so again, your options for tonight's cocktail, you guys get to pick, is grapefruit, blood orange, or lemon juice. So vote in the comments, and I'm going to go get my sugar that I forgot. So I'll be right back, vote in the comments. Sweetie Pie wants to come in. Can't leave the Sweetie Pie out in the cold. Okay, we have one vote for Blood Orange. which way sweetie pie voted? I can't. Well, so far with one vote, Blood Orange is going to win. Marty, <laughs> you might get your wish. 
I think I'm going to put you on the couch. Okay, Pai Pai? Alrighty, any other votes? Last chance for our choose our own adventure cocktail. Oh my gosh, I'm missing all these votes. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Okay, two votes for Blood Orange. Hi, Samantha and Elizabeth. <laughs> Glenn votes for grapefruit, even though he can't have it. Yes, she is adorable. Look at how cute she is. Sitting over there. Are you the cutest dog ever? Yes, you are. All right, we have two votes for Blood Orange, one vote for grapefruit. Any other takers? No? My mouse is really freaking out, you guys. I think I broke my mouse pad. Oh, well. Okay, going once, going twice. Otherwise, it's gonna be blood orange. Last call. I do also like grapefruit. I could also just make two cocktails. <laughs> But I think we'll start with one. Okay. So our winner is Blood Orange, which I don't know that much about Blood Oranges, actually. Oh, no. No, we have a grapefruit vote. It's tied. Okay. Who's going to be the deciding vote? You can't have voted yet. We're mixing celery-infused gin with citrus fruit. Okay, a Ashley voted for blood orange. Blood orange is in the lead again. All right, maybe I'll make grapefruit next time. I do love grapefruit and gin. It's just delicious, but no blood oranges in historic uh, recipe books that I could find so far. So we are gonna use blood orange. <gasps> I think I just stained my vintage tablecloth. <laughs> that makes me really sad, you guys, okay. So, look who's back. It's the juice of attic my favorite. This is going to be a very pretty cocktail, I have the feeling, because the blood orange juice is very red. Oh, sweetie got sick of me, I guess. You're trapped now, Pie Pie. All right, I'm going to use the whole thing. Oh, it always does this. There we go. Look at how much that uses. I love that thing. There's like no pulp even left. For those of you who are new to the Food History Happy Hour, um, this delightful little creature, the juice matic is from the 1940s which is fantastic when I found that out. Possibly from 1940. Wow, I'm kind of making a mess here with the blood orange. Okay, oh, yep, now Sweetie Pie really wants to leave. All right, fluffy girl. Mm, making a mess. There you go. She only wanted to visit, apparently. All right. Juice and attic. Can go off to the side. So, we're going to use a cocktail shaker. Put my little oranges out of the way here. It's a good thing I have a whole table. We need some ice. Oh, very melty ice. Uh, let's see, we'll do our blood orange juice. So yum. It does look really nice. We're going to do a teaspoon of sugar. I actually have a real teaspoon this time. I am going to measure. Because I like sweet drinks. I don't know, maybe it'll be too sweet. It's an experiment. And now... For our gin, which is still full of celery, <laughs> but it smells very interesting. I'm not sure how I feel about this. Hmm, kind of ginny, kind of celery-ish. 
I'm going to do an ounce and a half. Again with the nest making, Sarah. It is quite green, which is interesting. You guys can't see it. And I'm not going to risk tipping it anywhere near my laptop. But uh, in it goes. And make sure this is on so I don't get blood orange juice all over my white shirt. I maybe should have thought about that. tell you that I did, although I couldn't find any references to celery gin, I did find a couple of references from a 1903 bartender's guide to infusing gin with other aromatic herbs. So um, tansy gin was apparently a thing. Um, wormwood, of course wormwood being the main ingredient in absinthe, uh, wormwood infused gin was a thing. And strangely enough, um, there was a recipe to infuse gin with slivers from the center of a green pine log. So pine flavored gin. I don't know why juniper isn't piney enough, but so I figure even though there's no real recipe specifically for celery gin, I did find enough infused herbal infused gin recipes that it seems like it would be in that family. Um, I did also find a recipe that called for celery bitters, I believe also from 1903, that same cookbook. So we're going to see what it tastes like. Maybe I won't be able to taste celery at all. Maybe it'll just be blood orange. We'll find out. Oh. Hmm. You can taste the celery. Weird, it's almost got like kind of a caramely flavor, which I was not expecting. I mean, I guess I did put sugar in it, but it's just regular white sugar, so that shouldn't really taste like anything except for sweet. Hmm. Not as good as last week. <laughs> that desert healer, man. That was delicious. Um, but this is definitely drinkable. I would drink this. I would maybe take the celery out sooner, to be honest with you. Um, I think the celery oxidized a little bit. But other than that, it's definitely gorgeous, right? Look at how pretty that color is. Very springy. Um, if you don't like real sweet drinks, I would put in less sugar. Um, I like it, um, but probably half a teaspoon of sugar would have been enough. So yes, this is the Choose Your Own Adventure cocktail tonight with celery infused gin. So for those of you who missed the making, it's the juice of one blood orange. Not a very big one, you know, that big. Um, a teaspoon of sugar, which is maybe a little bit too much, and an ounce and a half of celery infused gin, shaken over ice in a cocktail glass. It's funny, Mart. So Marty says, I'd probably infuse for 36 to 48 hours. Otherwise, the chlorophyll starts to leach and it gets bitter. So the chlorophyll did leach out, but it doesn't taste bitter from the celery, surprisingly. It does taste a little oxidized. So I probably shouldn't have left it in there that long. But it was an experiment. So definitely I'll be straining, straining out whatever is in there now. Um, so yeah, that's my cocktail. What's everybody up to tonight? I hope people are having good weeks. I had kind of a long week, so I'm ready for the weekend. 
Probably going to do some yard work because it's supposed to be gorgeous. Um, maybe plant some flowers, trim back my beds. My daffodils are starting to be done. So that's my plans. What's everybody else doing? Hmm. Yeah. No comments. All right, well, we can talk about the evening's topic. So last time we got talking a little bit about sauces. Um, I still have not totally cracked the case of Heinz uh, celery sauce and its ingredients, mostly because I didn't have quite as much time to research this week as I thought I was going to. Um, but I did do a little digging on the mother sauces, French mother sauces which are basically the foundation of all late 19th century sauces. So Marie Antonin Carême, for those of you who are unfamiliar, is considered the father of French haute cuisine. Um, he was born in poverty, kind of raised himself up as a cook, um, and is considered the inventor of a number of dishes, including the French mother sauces. Um, so his original four mother sauces were sauce allemande, um, sauce espagnol, which is a brown sauce. Um, oh my gosh, I'm forgetting. Sauce velut. And what's the other one? Bechamel, white sauce, basically. So those are considered the four mother sauces. So bechamel is, they're all based on um, a brew of flour and fat. Bechamel, for instance, is butter and flour and um, milk, I believe. Uh, some of the other sauces use stock. Uh, and then later on, they introduced um, sauce tomate, tomato sauce, right? And uh, hollandaise, hollandaise sauce. So, um, yeah, I decided to pull a Anna Catherine who <laughs> put me on this whole thing of researching sauces and pull out my facsimile of the original oops, Boston Cooking School cookbook by Fanny Farmer. Um, now I should mention that tonight we're talking about savory sauces. Uh, she also has a whole section on dessert sauces, like hard sauce, foamy sauce, those kinds of things. Um, but we're going to talk about the savory ones. If I can find the section. I have to look up in the beginning. Here we go. Okay. It's page 236 for those of you who are following along with your own <laughs> copy of Fanny Farmer. So by the end of the 19th century, a lot of the French mother sauces were in fairly wide use. They're not that difficult to make, um, although some people would probably say that they are fairly difficult to master. The easiest of them all being the white sauce or the American version of bechamel. Um, for instance, whenever I make macaroni and cheese, from scratch, I don't make the pasta from scratch, but I make the sauce from scratch. So that starts the white sauce, butter and flour and milk. And then I put cheese and Dijon mustard in it. That's my secret and lots of salt because macaroni is very bland. Um, so yeah, so uh, velouté is the same thing as the white sauce, except for instead of using milk, you use white stock it's called, which is usually made from veal bones. Um, and there's all kinds of variation on that. And then sauce espanol is a brown sauce, um, which you use, you make with a dark brew. So you cook the flour and the fat over low heat for a fairly long time until the um, flour browns. And then you use uh, beef stock or brown stock. Um, to make the sauce. 
So I think a lot of people in the 19th century like to, or a lot of modern people, I should say, like to kind of poo-poo the foods of the 19th century and the turn of the century um, as being boring or bland. But as we discussed previously, um, I think people were really doctoring things up with all of these sauces. Like you might have poached fish or steak or roast beef or whatever, but you weren't necessarily eating it plain, especially in the higher level households, you were going to have all kinds of sauces to dress it up. So um, even though brown sauce is sauce espanol to begin with, Spanish sauce in the United States usually means a sauce made with ham and tomatoes. It's very Spanish, I guess. Um, and you get all kinds of crazy names for some of the sauces. And then of course, um, tomato sauce becomes a thing that eventually gives us ketchup. Right, we talked about that. And then of course also we have celery sauce in here, as Anna Catherine found out, which is just um you boil some celery chopped up and then put it in a white sauce. I don't know why people thought that was good, but that's what they did. Um then there's drawn butter, maitre d'hotel butter, all the kind of fun stuff. Bernays, Hollandaise, horseradish. Bread sauce. Don't know if anyone's ever heard of this bread sauce. Um, apparently, you serve it with roast game birds, but it's literally breadcrumbs and onions and milk and then spiced. Sounds very medieval to me. That's probably where it comes from. Also, in here is cauliflower sauce. Again, boiled cauliflower florets in a white sauce, except for you make your white sauce with some chicken stock. I don't know why people like that on meat. Maybe it was just a variation. Um, oh, have you had it? Tell us about celery and white sauce, Jerusha. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. I've never had it. I don't know that I particularly like cooked celery except for in soups. So, but tastes change. So the other sauce that I looked up a little bit because it is very ubiquitous in American cuisine is mustard, um, which I consider a sauce, even though it's really probably more of a condiment. Um, it's extraordinarily old. Mustard is one of the few spices that are native to Europe. Um, and of course it dates back to ancient times. And mustard is made by mixing ground mustard seeds with um, salt and vinegar, although the very earliest versions used wine instead of vinegar, as they often did. Um, so yeah, I just not used to like mustard. I've come around a little bit. I actually made a really delicious um, French lentil dish the other day, lentils Dijonese, which called for a mustard flavored white sauce. Um, with the lentils and onions and then ham. So it was a white sauce flavor with Dijon mustard with pui lentils, little green lentils, onions and ham. And that was very delicious. And I ate it on toast like a good Victorian would. Um, Glenn saw, says bread sauce sounds like somebody doesn't know how to make kvass. That's possibly true, um, but I have run across references in medieval recipes to, you know, using dried breadcrumbs in a sauce. They also use dried breadcrumbs in cakes and cookies and all kinds of things. Um, so yeah. So that's my sauce overview, which just took up way less time than I thought it was going to. So what else do you guys want to talk about? What are you curious about? Do any of you use any of the mother sauces in your cooking today? I'm curious, besides bechamel or, technically I think bechamel with cheese is a Mornay sauce. Okay, so Drusha is sharing her recipe. Um, cream, flour, nutmeg, salt, fried in a pan. My mother also used chicken broth as a starter, but we get it with celery, cauliflower, or green beans. I come from an English family, so lots of our food had sauces like this. Interesting. 
So what did you eat it with? Did you eat it with chicken or goose or whatever? They always recommend chicken or turkey or other fowl in the old cookbooks. I did run across one recipe, and I am eventually going to put this all in a blog post. I ran across one recipe um, that was a celery. It looked like a celery pickle. It said celery sauce, um, but it had tomatoes and vinegar in it, which sounded kind of interesting. So, so yeah. All right, my other thing that I brought to talk about um, is I acquired some new cookbooks recently. Um, I have not been able to go to the thrift store, obviously, for a very long time. And so I've been perusing the internet, which <laughs> is not great. Etsy is like, I actually still have stuff that I ordered from Etsy like a month ago, and it's still not here yet, I guess the post office is being really slow, but I did find two cookbooks I could not resist. And if you follow me on Instagram at Preserver Parish, uh, you probably saw a little preview of this. So I'm going to start with that one. So the first one is called Electrical Homemaking with 101 Recipes. And if you look, you'll see it's by the Buffalo, Niagara, and what? An Eastern Power Corporation which is why I bought it because I live in New York. So I get excited about this stuff. Um, but then I opened it up and it's actually published by the electrical leave of league of Cleveland, which made me a little sad, but it's published in 1926. Um, and it's very interestingly arranged. It's got the electrical homemaking information up top and then the recipes are just in little boxes down here at the bottom. Um, yeah, it's an interesting little book. It's I was fascinated by it because it talks about a lot of gadgets that are not around anymore. Um, and it talks all about the convenience of all the electrical things that you could have in your household. Oh, Jerusalem adds um, oh, pasta, chicken, pasta, white sauces on Fridays. Fridays were no meat days. So vegetables, pasta, and rice days. Interesting. Interesting. Pasta with celery sauce. Could be good. Kind of like a Alfredo sauce. Um, so some of the things that are shown in here are like the electric drying cupboard, which they still use in some... European countries instead of a tumble dryer like most of Americans use. Um, where's my favorite part? Oh, very interesting uh, layout of an early refrigerator. Overly simplistic drawing, perhaps. Oh, uh, where's the one that I want to show you? Mm, this is a fun one. Electricity in the dining room. I love these illustrations. I will digitize this cookbook at some point. Um, but it talks about the electricity in the dining room talks about um, the coffee percolator, the tea samovar, the electric toaster, the electric grill. Yes, you have a little electric grill on the table. Uh, waffle irons. The electric table stove. I have never even heard of that. And then my favorite, the electric chafing dish. So chafing dishes, for those of you who don't know, um, are basically glorified hot plates, right? It's a little thing on legs. Usually it's a pan with sides that sits over and it sits over a flame or when you get to the 1920s, an electric one. Um, and you use it to cook things table side. It was a huge fad um, starting in like the eight, late 1880s, early 1890s. And that segues right into my other cookbook that I got, which is called, it's a very beautiful illustration cover, sorry. The Bachelor's Chafing Dish. Sorry, The Bachelor and the Chafing Dish. 
my apologies. Um, illustrated. It's a really interesting little book. Uh, it was published in 1896. It's dedicated to her. We'll get into that in a minute. Um, and it's written in a very engaging style and illustrated. It is, however, quite misogynistic, as you might expect from a cookbook written in the 1890s by a man about cooking. Um, he basically talks about how, why can't women get interested in cooking? He's like the most intelligent ones and the least interested in cooking and cooking is so easy and anybody can do it and here I'll show you. So he writes down all these little vignette stories about people he's encountered and, you know, hardy men who are cooking things and chafing dishes and camping. So he's camping with Ed, right? All these little stories that talk about how to cook various things. Um, so chafing dishes were, yeah, <laughs> Marty says, I'm trying to imagine any bachelors I know to have a chafing dish. So it's kind of, I think really in many ways, it's sort of like um, the late 19th century analog to like half grill, half microwave. <laughs> uh, it was basically, people didn't really do real regular cooking in it. Um, it was often used for more high end table side cooking, like people would like fry oysters in it. You might make a uh, Welsh rare bit or rabbit it was a very popular dish. It's basically like melted cheese fondue that you would pour over toast. Um, you know, things like hot olives, burnt almonds, um, sort of more like midnight supper type stuff, eggs, that kind of thing. Um, you know, stuff in a white sauce that you would pour over the things. But so the interesting thing about this book is that, you know, he talks about how, oh, it's so easy to cook and blah, blah, blah. But there's almost always somebody else has already done a lot of the cooking for you in order to facilitate chafing dish cooking. So like a lot of the recipes, if you're going to make, say, like a chicken dish in a white sauce, you have to start with already cooked chicken. Or if you're going to make Welsh rarebit, somebody has to have already made the bread right? To make the toast. <laughs> so it's this very fascinating little snippet of um, sort of manly bachelordom. But yes, this is this is like a manly thing, chafing dish cookery. I think by the time you get to the 1920s, um, especially once you get to electric chafing dishes, they kind of fizzle out a little bit. There's no more open flame. Um, and I think it's just not quite as manly romantic kind of thing anymore. You're not cooking oysters or, you know, rare duck breast or steaks, you know, things like that cooking table side. Um, but I'd never heard of this little cookbook. It seemed too fascinating to resist. Um, and just the kind of thing a food historian would like to have. So I treated myself. So those are my most recent cookbook acquisitions. Okay, you guys are very quiet tonight. What's going on with everybody? Anybody have any other questions? This is totally growing on me, by the way. Yeah. It's funny if you smell it, you can't really smell the gin that much. Mostly what you're smelling is celery, which is not a bad thing. I'm out of stuff to talk about, you guys. Oh, I might be on television again. We'll see. I have an interview on Monday, so I'm not going to tell you what it's for, but that might be kind of fun. So, hoping to work some more on my book this weekend. when I'm not. Oh, Marty asked, will I taste just the infused gin? Yes. For you, Marty, I will. 
Although, like I said, I'm kind of regretting leaving the celery in there for so long. But I'm going to drink it right out of my... Uh, out of my jigger here. What do you want to know about it before I drink it? Yeah, it's a very pronounced celery flavor, which I like. Yep. I recommend celery infused gin. Just don't leave the celery in for as long as I did. A week is too long. I think Marty's right that like, uh, 24 to 48 hours is probably better. Because the problem is, is like, it, it's, um, it tastes a little bit like it looks, let's put it that way. It tastes a little wilty. You know how some vegetables smell when they get a little wilty? That's what it smells like. It doesn't really taste that much like that, but It is fairly bitter, but I can't tell if that's just a gin or if it's a celery. Because also, you know, this is not like crazy expensive gin, so. Oh, <laughs> Glenn said, a friend was asking what to do with a lot of celery this week, so I directed her here when the replay is available. Yes. I have to say, celery infused gin, I would totally make again. Marty says it would probably be great in a Bloody Mary. I bet it would be great in a Bloody Mary. The tomato juice might overpower the celery flavor a little bit. Um, you'd have to see. But, yeah, it would be good in a Bloody Mary if I liked Bloody Marys. As we discussed last week, I hate tomato juice. I love tomatoes. I don't like the spices in the tomato juice. It's too salty, too. So, Blood orange it was. I have to say the blood orange and the sugar, man, really smoothed out the gin compared to drinking it straight. I tend not to like alcohol that really burns, so this doesn't burn at all. But you still get that, especially in the aftertaste. Like the blood orange is sweet up front, and obviously all the sugar that I put in it. Um, but then that aftertaste is of celery, which I like. Alrighty, any other burning food history questions? Um, I did check my cookbook library for saucings. I thought I had a book about ketchup, but it turns out um, I don't. It's actually a book about tomato soup. Although the guy who wrote it, Andrew F. Smith, um, is a food historian who's written a bajillion food history books. Um, and this is actually his third book on tomatoes. He wrote one, I think just about tomatoes, one about ketchup, and then this one is about tomato soup. And I don't know if Andy Post is watching, but it is a lot about um, Jersey tomatoes and the truck garden in particular um, tomato industry in New Jersey. So if you're interested in Jersey tomatoes, I would recommend this book. There's also about a bajillion um, tomato soup recipes <laughs> in the back. Like I would say it's a good sixth of the book is historic tomato soup recipes. Not as much context for the recipes as I would like. Um, but they're in there if anybody's interested. And then the other book, which I actually haven't read yet, because I do this thing that I think a lot of collectors do where you just like hoard books and then never read them. Do other people do that too? I do. Um, but it is a history of peanut butter in America, which is also kind of a sauce, right? So I thought that would be appropriate. Although I'm, now I'm looking at the back, says so it's a wonderfully gossipy look at peanut butter. Maybe might not be the best recommendation. I don't know. But it's talk about peanut butter if anybody's interested in it. I know peanut butter. I saw an article. Um, the other day about why everybody else, hi Becca, why everybody else thinks Americans are crazy for eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. I didn't really have to read it because I've read a bunch of articles before about that. If somebody always brings up Vegemite and Marmite, <laughs> as sort of the uh, Australian and I think British 
analogs to peanut butter. I could not agree, disagree more with that because peanut butter is kind of in its own class. I think Elizabeth Horeb, I love peanut butter too. Love it. Like I'm the kind of person who, if I'm craving something sweet, I get the natural unsweetened peanut butter. So I have to mix in a sweet sometimes, but I'll just like take a little, a little custard cup with some peanut butter in it. Maybe a little maple syrup or honey. And I'll just eat that. Especially if there's no dessert around, which there isn't very often in our house, because if I had dessert around too often, I would eat it way more than I should. So that's kind of like my little thing that I do for dessert. But yes, we're big peanut butter fans. I know not everybody is. I think it's probably how exposed to it you are as a child. Um, Becca speaks from experience that peanut butter is way better than Marmite. I will take your word for it. Although I think Marmite, isn't Marmite like beef tea sort of, like condensed beef tea? Let me look it up quick. Vegemite is like brewer's yeast. Ha! Marmite contains celery! Oh my gosh, that's so funny. Oh no, it's a yeast extract also. Okay. With celery extracts, that is hilarious. Um, although I think it's more liquidy than Vegemite. Yeah, so Vegemite is yeast extract and malt extract, and Marmite is yeast extract and celery extract. That celery keeps showing up. <laughs> okay, Elizabeth says, are there drinks with peanut butter? And Marty says, oh, yes, Marty being our resident uh, bartender and cocktail mistress. I just dabble for fun for my own amusement. Marty does it professionally. Um, I, Marty, are there any drinks that like aren't basically alcoholic milkshakes that contain <laughs> peanut butter? I'd be curious to know that. Of course, we don't really get widespread use of peanut butter until the 20th century, thanks to people like George Washington Carver, right? Interesting thing, the 20th century, like, so peanuts are, of course, not actually, neither pea nor nut their legume, right? Um, and peanuts and soybeans were both kind of like having the same moment at the same time. They were like these easy to grow, protein rich, formerly largely animal fodder <laughs> crops that people in the turn of the 20th century uh, were kind of experimenting to see uh, if they could come up with good protein alternatives to meat. Um, so peanut butter, obviously, I think much tastier than soy bean products personally. Um, but there was a lot of attempt, particularly in the thirties and forties to have like soy meal, um, be a thing as a food substitute. Um, so thankfully we don't have, uh, soy butter. <laughs> I don't think that would taste very good. Um, oh, what's okay now, Marty? You have to tell us what a peanut butter simple is. Is that just like peanut butter and booze? I don't know. And what kind of peanut butter do you use? I said, as I said earlier, I am partial to natural peanut butter, which is just roasted, salted peanut butter, or sorry, salted peanuts, roasted salted peanuts that you grind up. I've had some truly terrible natural peanut butters where they do not roast the peanuts enough and it tastes kind of like wallpaper paste. Do not recommend. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Peanut butter simple syrup. All right. I could see that. I could see that going down pretty smooth. All right. That sounds yummy. But I like fruits in my alcohol, I think, the best. And celery, apparently. Well, does anybody want to talk about anything else? Oh, I'm trying to think if there's any other, like, news going around to share. Oh, I did share an article earlier about um, why can't you buy vanilla 
and bitters in the liquor store. <laughs> this is something that drives me crazy um, because every Christmas we make an 18th century inspired punch called Second Horse Punch. And one of the ingredients is a lot of Angostura bitters um, along with um, white rum and peach brandy and lemon juice and um, brown sugar. And then you mix it with either sparkling water or ginger ale, we prefer ginger ale um, to make the punch. But it takes like a double batch and we usually make it in like quadruple batches. <laughs> A double batch requires um, actually more than a whole bottle of Angostura bitters. So whenever we go to stock up on the alcohol to make these big batches of um, punch, because the longer you age it, the better it tastes, um, I always have to remember to go to the grocery store and stock up on Angostura bitters because they don't sell them in the liquor store, which is odd because bitters are usually like 40 to 45 percent alcohol which is about 80 or 90 proof um this is the same with vanilla extract and other extracts are also extremely high proof and again you get those in the grocery store not the liquor store and it turns out that once again everything goes back to prohibition during prohibition a number of alcohol producers um sort of switched over to producing flavor extracts. And the way that they got around it was they basically said, well, the flavor extracts are too unpalatable uh, for people to actually drink them as alcohol, which anybody who's ever tried to drink or had a taste of just plain vanilla extract is true. It is not very good. Um, do not recommend. <laughs> um, so that's kind of how they got away with it. And also bitters, sort of got lumped in as a flavor extract because it, even in cocktail recipes, you usually don't use that much. It's more of a flavoring agent and it's actually an alcohol. And uh, Angostura bitters and a couple of other bitter companies, but mostly just Angostura and I think Peychaud's, maybe like one other bitters company are like the only ones to survive prohibition. And they do that as by kind of rebranding as a flavor extract. Like there's Angostura in particular has all kinds of recipes where it's like, using Angostura bitters in like fruit salad and chicken salad and all these desserts and things like that as like kind of a spicy flavoring agent rather than a cocktail ingredient. <laughs> um, so they kind of weather prohibition that way. And then of course, once prohibition is over, Angostura bitters is like, hey, use this in cocktails again, but they stay in grocery stores because of the laws around flavoring agents that use high proof alcohol. So Fun fact, that's why you have to buy many of your cocktail ingredients, <laughs> including things like Rosa's Lime and Maraschino cherries and um, stuff like that. You have to get it at the grocery store and not the liquor store. So that's my little story. I actually thought about putting orange bitters in today's cocktail, but I don't think it needs it. Also, the orange bitters I have, I don't really like very much. So I might have to get different ones. Anybody else have any questions? You guys are so quiet today. Is it because it's nice out? Some more of me were like being outside. <laughs> what? Finished it. Pretty tasty. I have like literally nothing else to talk about you guys. <laughs> what should I make next? What should I make next week? I have zero plans for what kind of cocktail I should make next week. Something with grapefruit. Something with egg white. Since I already made something with a whole egg, so I'm like not afraid of eggs anymore. <laughs> oh, I will say one of the reasons why I didn't make a historic um, infused gin recipe is because they were all like basically serve over shaved ice. So it's like a goblet of shaved ice and the bottle was was how they served it in the bar, which I can't think that that would be a very good um, way to do it. But, oh, Becca says that, could I make some orange bitters? I could, but I have to order a lot of special ingredients. Um, 
Yeah, the main bittering agent in bitters is dried gentian root from the gentian flower. Um, although I have heard rumors that young um, black walnut leaves can be used as a bittering agent. And I do have a ton of black walnut trees around my house. And it is springtime when they would be nice and young. So I might look into that. I do also have some other weird ingredients that I happen to have are um, dried spruce tips that I collected myself and I have never ever done anything with. They just sit in a jar. <laughs> um, and then I also have like a pine flavored shrub, a commercially produced pine flavored shrub. So I can maybe do something weird with that. I'll think about it. Um, maybe next time I will talk about um, spruce beer. That's a thing in the 18th century that you make out of spruce tips, I believe. So I can do a little bit more research and talk about that. And now that you've asked me to make bitters and I've remembered that I have black walnut trees everywhere, um, maybe I'll try and concoct something. We'll find out. Marty says spruce chips are good in home brew. Yeah, I'm not actually gonna brew beer. That's, I like this kind of alcohol <laughs> making where you just throw some stuff in grain alcohol and let it sit for a while. That's my favorite part because it's really easy. Um, anything that requires fermentation Not trying to do that. Oh, Ashley asks, do I know where to find any ramps? All right, we're going to talk about this a little bit because this is kind of a controversial thing. So ramps are a type of wild onion that are native to the United States. Um, they have the bulbs look a little bit like uh, scallions, the white parts of scallions. Um, but the leaves, instead of being like a tube of green, um, they're actually really floppy, um, kind of spear-shaped leaves and there's several on each plant. Um, they are kind of a cross between garlic and onion. They're very strong flavored. Not everybody likes them. They've become kind of a thing. They're native to most of the Appalachian mountain range um, and sort of down the mountain from there. They got popular because of Appalachian food ways that have these long traditions of um, foraging and wild harvesting. Um, however, Ramps are a bulb vegetable, um, and they do not reproduce very quickly. And if you harvest them in the spring, which is when they're mostly growing, um, and you pull them up by the roots, which is what a lot of people do, um, it tends to kind of decimate the supply. So wild ramps are a little bit in danger of over harvesting. Um, and they're not very easy to cultivate. So I actually stopped eating ramps for that reason, um, because I did not want them to get over harvested. And also because um, garlic scapes and green garlic um, are a fair approximation of the flavor. So it's not like it's this unattainable thing that you can get. There are people who disagree that ramps can't be harvested sustainably. Um, I can't really think of any reasons why you would want to harvest them. Um, one thing I do have growing in abundance in my yard, um, which I probably could do something with, but I don't, is wild onions, which again are very similar to um, green onions. They have these little bulbs that grow on the ground, little rootlets coming out of the bottom. Um, but they have very skinny, slender stalks that look sort of like grass, but they usually get taller. So if you go out in your yard and you see this tall kind of thick looking grass sometimes the ends get a little curly um go over and break some off and smell it and if it smells like onions you have wild onions in your yard and you can dig them up uh, i live right next to a very busy road we get a lot of road dust um so i tend not to harvest anything from my front yard which is where all the wild onions are um so i haven't done any of that but that's a slightly more sustainable alternative to ramps because wild onions grow like everywhere and ramps do not Okay, Ashley also asked, a lot of people are making bread and buying chickens, gardening. Do you think this will stay? 
what do we see historically? So I actually had a whole, been having a series of conversations actually with some journalists, different journalists about um, the historical analogs between um, what's happening now and things that have happened in the past. Definitely victory gardens, or as some people are calling them hope gardens, are a thing. Um, people are scared about the food supply and actually um, as coronavirus spreads in the United States, there's been a lot of stuff in the news about shutting down um, meat packing plants in particular, um, and also about um, the lack of labor and also the lack of market to get fresh vegetables harvested. Um, <laughs> Becca says, I used to eat the grass part of that from my yard as a kid. Yes, wild onion grass tastes like onion. You can eat it. So check your yard and see if you have any. Um, but just from my feeling, I think we probably will start to see increased shortages going forward, not just of food, but of all goods that require factory conditions, basically, places where you cannot social distance. Um, as coronavirus spreads into factories, I think I saw an a news article today that there's a Smithfield, which is Smithfield ham support processing. There's a Smithfield um, processing plant where all 900 workers tested positive for coronavirus. So then that raises the specter of uh, food supply contamination issues. Um, so I don't think that planting vegetables and buying chickens is a bad idea. Um, but you got to know what you're getting into. And this is an issue that they had both in World War I and World War II in particular. Um, I actually did a talk at a food studies conference a number of years ago, a little case study on an article I found in the New York Times called Mr. and Mrs. Novice. And it was sort of like a polite ribbing of people who had no idea what they were doing trying to plant victory gardens and all the mistakes that they made and how not to make those same mistakes. Um, there were complaints in World War I of people wasting seed because they were buying up all the seed. There were seed shortages, which again is kind of happening now. And people were wasting it because they didn't know how to plant properly. They weren't germinating their seed properly. Um, or they would plant a garden and then abandon it because they didn't want to weed it or whatever. That was, those were all things that were happening in both World Wars and will probably happen now. Um, with chickens. There is added concern of people buying chickens and not having any idea how to take care of them. So, you know, potential animal cruelty there by people jumping in feet first without doing their research. Um, but I think whether or not these things will stay, and again, this is a conversation I've been having a lot with journalists, whether or not things will stick around and whether or not these changes will stick um, depends entirely on what happens after. If we go back to exactly the way things were, um, I don't think you'll see a lot of those changes stick, um, particularly if we go back to our prior levels of employment with no alteration in schedules. Like if we don't see an increase in telecommuting, I don't think that uh, people having chickens and planting gardens and baking bread from scratch is going to stick around because they simply won't have the time to do it, right? Um, but if we do see some major societal changes, like if we see an increase in telecommuting, um, or if we see a reduction in hours, which is another thing that has been proposed that, um, as we reopen, um, we have people work condensed work weeks or fewer hours, um, so that schedules can be staggered and you sort of minimize, um, contact, contact and maximize social distancing. People might have more spare time to keep doing those things. Um, it's also going to depend what happens to the economy afterwards. Um, it's going to be difficult to maintain unemployment levels like we have now in the long term, simply be, and shutdowns in the long term, simply because we will not have the tax revenue and we'll be going even more massively into debt. So that will probably trigger a recession. <laughs> Sorry to get depressing, but if that happens, people might not have the um, disposable income that they had before to be able to buy prepared foods and meal kits and be going out to eat all the time. Um, I will think that things that will stick will be 
the skills. So whether or not people actually use them, the skills that they're building right now, they will have access to like forever going forward, basically. Like once you learn how to bake bread from scratch and do it well, you don't forget that. So you can, it's like riding a bike, you can pick that up again um, whenever you want to. Same with cooking from scratch and sort of making do and experimenting with, you know, cooking what's ever in your cupboard. I actually have not been grocery shopping for more than a week. We're running a little low on milk, so I'm probably going to have to go out at some point uh, this weekend. But I'm pretty proud that it's been like nine or ten days and I have not purchased any food outside the home. Except for tonight, I get to, to get takeout tonight because I didn't feel like cooking <laughs> after working and then getting ready for tonight. Um so I did cheat a little bit, but I didn't go to the grocery store. So Aaron says beans and rice. Yes, the other thing that I hope happens is that um, as slaughterhouses and meatpacking plants um, shut down or slow down or partially close, um, even though this is not very nice for the farmers and the animals they're raising, I hope people will um, start experimenting more with vegetarian or vegan cuisine. I'm not militant about it. I don't think you have to eat it all the time. I eat meat. Um, but eating less meat is good. It's good for the planet. It's good for your health. Um, we don't need to eat meat every meal three times a day. We just don't. We don't live crazy strenuous lives. Um, so yeah, I think that would be better for everybody. Marty says yes. Yeah, so one of the... Um, I've come across a couple of vegetable cookbooks from the 19th century and the turn of the 20th century. And once my book is done, I'm trying not to add any more projects, you guys, because I'm really trying to finish my book. But once my book is done, um, one of my projects, I think, is going to be either a class or a cookbook of vintage vegetable slash vegetarian cooking and cuisine. Because I'm super interested in that. Because I love vegetables. I'm sure if my mother is watching, she's totally shocked to hear that. <laughs> because when I was a kid, I did not like vegetables. I was one of those kids who would like eat spaghetti sauce and pick all the onions out. Or if we had hamburger helper and my mom put frozen peas in it, I would pick all the peas out. Um, but now I love vegetables. And I think a lot of people have not really had vegetables cooked well. I think there are still a lot of home cooks in America who serve only canned vegetables or, you know, their idea of vegetable is a potato. <laughs> and uh, I delight in introducing people to how delicious vegetables can be when prepared well. So once we're done with World War I, wow, I did not mean to make that rhyme, but once we're done with World War I, that's, I think, going to be one of my next projects, along with cookbooks in general. So, all right. Good questions, Ashley. Thanks for filling up the end of our food history hour. Uh, last call. Last call for questions. I've already long finished my cocktail. Yeah, one last little drop. Last call for questions. No. All right. Well, I'm just going to make a little announcement um, that next Wednesday, I think it's next Wednesday. Let me just double check. Yes. Next Wednesday, the 6th, I am doing a talk on cookbooks uh, for the New City Library. If you go to the events section of my Food Historian Facebook page, you will see it there. It is a free talk. Um, we'll be doing it live via Zoom. You do have to pre-register. So if you want to talk about cookbooks uh, with me, we can definitely do that. It is also a little bit of an overview of food trends in America. It will talk very briefly about World War I, but we basically go from the late 18th century all the way to the present. Um, and if you can't join us on Wednesday the 6th, I'll be doing it again on the 19th. Oh, Becca asked about the cocktail. Yes, below review. And the cocktail that is no more is not actually a historic cocktail. It was one that we made up 
kind of on the air. It was an ounce and a half of celery infused gin, the juice of one blood orange, a teaspoon of sugar, uh, shaken over ice in a cocktail glass. Pretty delicious. Um, so not a historic recipe, but inspired by historic recipes of infusing gin uh, with aromatic herbs, including tansy, wormwood, and pine, believe it or not. Uh, it doesn't have a name, so maybe you guys can come up with a name. I can't think of any. It's just a celery blood orange gin cocktail right now. So if you think of a cool name, drop it in the comments. Uh, and whichever one I like, I'll announce next week. And if you have any suggestions for next week's cocktail, you can drop that in the comments too or send me a message. Um, and yeah, I think that's it for this week's Food History Happy Hour. Thanks everybody again for joining me. Um, you can catch me on Instagram at Preserve Our Parish. Visit the website, thefoodhistorian.com. Uh, and we will see you next week at 8 o'clock on Friday. All right. Thanks so much. Bye.